those of you who are staying, <laughs> and good evening to those of you who are leaving. As you may have seen the title, let's talk about Titus. Okay. Even though he's sitting right there, we're going to talk about him. I think he should. Um, we're going to talk about Titus and kind of do a more of an overview of the entire book, just in that I like doing character studies. I like looking at people's lives, um, part of it from being the oral historian. I, I enjoy getting to know people like that. And as you all know, obviously, I am a teacher. I am not a pastor. So my interest comes from a different angle. And when I was thinking about different characters and thinking of you came up with a list of well-known New Testament figures. Generally speaking, Titus isn't one of them. Not somebody you usually think about. But as I was studying, I came across an article by a Connor Salter who kind of had the same thoughts of, who is Titus? Why do we read him? Why should we read the book of Titus? What purpose is it? What can we get out of it? And we are going to look into that as far as who is he? What happened to him after he travels with Paul? And look a little bit more into his life, and some of it will be speculation because not much is known about him, especially after. I mean, there are some thoughts, some theories, some ideas of where he went. But his letter from Paul gives us valuable insights gives us insights into the early church and instruction for us today. And some of it, when we get into the latter portion of the book, we'll see how applicable it really is, even in our search for a pastor. We'll see the wisdom in Titus, the insights that we need. So before we do that, let's pray, then we'll look at Titus. Dear Holy Father, again, we thank you for the opportunity to be here this evening. We Thank you for your word. And again, as we look at someone we may not know as much about, we see the warnings. We see the wisdom. We see your instruction throughout. And even though much of the book is, it, it just sounds depressing, or reading about people and their behavior, there is hope at the end. There is a purpose that we see, that we come away understanding that nobody, there's nobody out there that cannot be reached, that cannot be saved. So, Father, as we look through the Word and sift through what you have, just pray that we would open our hearts and minds to what you have to say and that we would see that nobody is unsalvageable. And we thank you and pray this in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. So, who was Titus? We know he was one of at least two young men that Paul discipled. And he describes him as the son in faith that we share. I want to read Titus chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. This is Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. But hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God, our Savior, to Titus, my own son after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Again, we see, obviously, how Paul views Titus, my own son after the common faith, the relationship there. There's a love there. He knows Titus's character. He knows who he is. The other one that he typically mentioned with Paul is Timothy. Um, 2 Corinthians addresses Paul and Timothy to the church in Corinth. Uh, 2 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1. in his introduction, he states Timothy. So again, we know Timothy and Titus, two young men that were discipled by Paul. Some two young men that he trusted, that he knew would not let him down, that he knew were faithful men. Both Timothy and Titus serve as messengers traveling companions. They both go on to lead local churches. Again, raised up by Paul. He not only mentors them, goes beyond that, but he advises them in their letters 
for their next steps, what to do. Okay. In the event that I am not here anymore, he prepares them, prepares them to lead. Now, Titus's background is not explained. We don't get details into who he is other than the fact he was a Gentile. He was apparently never circumcised. We see that in Galatians 2, 3, which we'll look at in a little while. Now, what's interesting about that is Timothy, who was half Greek, not circumcised either, but Paul chose to. Paul chose to circumcise him to honor the Jews in the area where they were ministering. Um, turn with me to Acts chapter 16, please. Acts 16, verse 1. Says, then came he to Derby in Lystra. Behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which is a Jewess and believed, but his father was a Greek, which was well reported by the brethren that were in Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have, have gone to forthwith with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters. They're known that his father was a Greek. Again, Paul will repeatedly mention in his letters that circumcision was not necessary under the new covenant. Warns against it. He tells Titus to silence Christians who try to promote it. Back in Titus chapter 1, in verse 10, says, For there are many unruly and vain talkers, deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not, for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This, no, we'll get back to that one. This witness is true, wherefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. So Paul's choice to circumcise Timothy seems an interesting one, but it suggests that he has a practical side. It's a pragmatic side. And he did not require his disciples to be circumcised, but the situation calls for it. If it calls for working among the Jews and makes it easier, makes it more palatable to him, he would concede it and work with them. So we see Paul's take on it. So we don't know whether Titus ever ministered to the Jewish community. It's not stated, but we do know Timothy did, but we also know they both worked in Gentile areas. Timothy in Ephesus, Titus in Crete, Crete Corinth, and Dalmatia. So again, we see their different audiences. As we get into Titus, some of the major themes of the book. We know a little more about him, but what are some of the themes, Titus 1, verse 5. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou should set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I had appointed thee. Again, to appoint elders in each town, suggesting there are multiple Christian groups. Think in today's terms, house churches. Groups meeting throughout the city, throughout the region, collectively known as the church in Crete. But it goes on, it transitions through several subjects. So more than just appointing elders in the town, but also to set things that are wanting. It's been appointed. And one of the major themes is character requirements of being an elder. If you're gonna appoint elders, you need to know their character. Starting in verse six of Titus chapter one. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, Having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. For a bishop must be blameless, as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Tough list. But to live up to that, to be an elder, actually very serious. According to Paul, the elders must live blamelessly, be good husbands, children who are of like faith, not unruly, no riot. 
but they're also to be generous and hospitable. And qualities you look for in a pastor, in a leader. You must not only uh, teach sound doctrine, sound teachings, but oppose false teachings. Don't allow it to get in. Don't allow false teachings to start to change and show where mistakes are made. Again, through God's word, correcting. Conduct for the congregants. Turn to Titus chapter 2, please. We'll look at chapters 2 and 3. Titus chapter 2, verse 1. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. The aged women, likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to too much wine, teachers of good things. They may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded, in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters, and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. And in Titus chapter 3, it continues. Verse 1, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready in every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to mercy, he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is faithful saying, these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men, but avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law. For they're unprofitable and vain. Man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth being condemned of himself. Again, we see a lot, a lot to take in there of what people are like, what we should be like. And because of God, because of the love he has, because of his son dying, we have the ability through his kindness and love we know how to act. We know what we should be doing. Titus, the letter to Titus reaffirms that, but reminds us it's not normal, not, not normal human behavior to live like God wants us to. Human nature, we want to go the other way. We don't always want to be obedient. We don't mind gossiping. It's human nature, but he reminds us through God, we can overcome that. Paul exhorts older men to live lives worthy of respect, have patience and love. Older women encouraged to avoid slander, excessive drinking, encourage young women to be good wives and mothers. And guys, we're not off the hook either to avoid the slander or gossiping, just saying. Young men encouraged to live wisely. Think for Titus, being a young man himself, being a model for these people, to show them they're going to be looking to him. Some may look at him suspiciously. He's young, what does he know? So he's got a lot to live up to here. Slaves exhorted to be trustworthy and obedient. Servants to not answer back. Be trustworthy. Church as a whole, exhorted to submit to authorities. Avoid fighting, but 
avoid foolish discussions. Again, I know we've all heard stories about some things that can cause church splits, sometimes over something very simple, what we might consider to be stupid, but it happens and people divide over seemingly foolish discussions. Fights ensue and we're told in Titus 3.9, Avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law. They're unprofitable and vain. Avoid foolish discussions. They're vain. The book of Titus also looks at the futility of heresy. Be back in chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 10. Now again, we just read the qualifications for an elder. Well, starting in verse 10, we see why, why these qualifications are there. It says, for there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not, for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply, they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, to every good work reprobate. Again, rather strong words coming from Paul here. Again, you know God, but your works deny him. It's abominable. That's why the qualifications of the leader, of the elder, of what Timothy or what Titus is looking for, this is what he's up against. So you can see ver, uh, chapter 3, verse 9, uh, 9 through 11. We just read, but avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they're unprofitable and vain. A man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition, reject, knowing that, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. You know, like I said at the beginning, this book does not take human condition in a good light. I mean, we're reading about pretty much all the problems with mankind. And it can be a very depressing book if you don't follow through and stick with it. Again, Paul highlights the foolish people in Crete, the church. They fool others with useless talk, the vain fightings, getting into arguments that need not be. He calls these people foolish, but he also has a warning for Titus. They're worthless for doing anything good. Uh, chapter 1, verse 15 he does tell him, unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. He's telling them, these people appear worthless, no good, they're defiled. Every bit of them, mind, body, spirit, but it doesn't mean they're beyond turning around. It doesn't mean they're beyond all hope. Remember, through Christ, love of God, it is possible. Paul advises Titus to handle these things by rebuking them to make them strong in faith. He's not telling him, just go in and start yelling at them, telling them everything you're doing is wrong, you're horrible people. He's not telling them that. But he's telling them that to rebuke them, to make them strong through God's word. Show them what is wrong. Don't go in yelling and screaming saying, you're wrong, I'm right. Show them through the word. Rebuke them with their errors. Additionally, advises Titus to give a first and second warning in chapter 3, verse 10. And people still don't repent after the second, he should have nothing to do with them. Does tell him in verse 10 to the second admonition, reject. Yeah, but go to them. Talk to them. The other major theme and what makes this have hope, what shows us hope, is the freedom and glory we have in Christ, in and amongst all of the negative that is being written here. Everything that 
Paul is showing Titus as a young man, this is what you're going to expect. This is what you're going to encounter. Just because you're going into these church groups, it doesn't mean it's going to be perfect. I do recall when I first started to teach at a Christian school that Steve came to me and told me again, you're working in a Christian environment. You're not working in heaven. The people are not going to be perfect. You're still dealing with people. You're still going to deal with everything Paul just told Titus here. This is the true nature, but there is freedom and glory in Christ. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Looking for that blessed hope, the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. And shows him through God. And in the end, these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. The word of God gives him the authority. This isn't just Paul's idea or Titus's idea. It's the word of God. It reminds him, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. In Titus chapter 3, verse 3, for we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice, envy, hateful, and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration, renewing of the Holy Spirit. And he reminds us, we've all been fooled. We've all been deceived. We've all gone down these wrong paths at times. However, after the kindness and love of God, uh, our Savior toward man appeared. And through him, through his washing, and we are changed. And we need to be living the way we ought to be living. Being described how the church should act, Paul gives the grace of God as the reason for them to behave this way. Same for us. The grace of God gives us the ability. For that reason, we should be living in a way that will be honoring to him. To show appreciation, to show the respect. Christians were once slaves to their sins. But we've been saved through the grace of God, and we ought to turn away from the godless living and focus on him, as Titus 2.12 says. People place their trust in something beyond how they're going to be treated in this world, but in the eternal promise of salvation. Again, we look beyond this world. We serve God, not this world. Again, we need to be focused on that. So did you ever wonder what happened to Titus after Paul wrote to him? Like I said, there's not much written about him. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 2, please. Uh, Galatians 2, verse 1. Then 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And that because of the false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy on our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. And we see here that Paul mentions that Titus accompanied he and Barnabas to Jerusalem some 14 years later. Also mentioned in Acts 15, they went to the council at Jerusalem to debate whether Christians should be circumcised or not. 
Titus being uncircumcised, his presence there as Paul's disciple cut right to the heart of that discussion. They knew Paul's reputation. Obviously, we're not going to go into that tonight. That would just be way too long. They knew Paul's reputation. They knew who he was. And the fact that Titus is there with him shows there isn't some certain law you have to follow. There aren't certain rules you have to follow. It's a new covenant. It's completely different. The council determined Christians don't need to be circumcised, but they laid out basic moral rules that believers had to follow. And you can read that. It's Acts 15, 22 to 30. 2 Corinthians tells us Titus was sent to the Corinth church after Paul had sent them a rather stern letter. So if you want to turn with me to 2 Corinthians, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Second Corinthians 7, I'm going to read verses 6 through 10. Says, Nevertheless, God that comforted those that were cast down, comforted us by the coming of Titus, not by his coming only, by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you when he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent love, your fervent mind toward me, that I rejoice the more. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. Though I did repent, for I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice, not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance, for ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh, worketh death. Again, Paul sends a rather stern letter to the Corinthian church, but then he encourages them to embrace, again, this ministry of giving, this ministry, and think what he said when they saw Titus. Again, you were comforted by the coming of Titus. We'll talk about that more in a moment. But after, and he even admits, I wrote this to the point where you were made sorry. But he pointed out a lot, but at the same time, it worked for good. Because again, rebukes them in the word and showing what Titus is being told as well. Uh, 2 Corinthians 8, 6, and 7 says, Insomuch that we desired Titus, that as he had begun, so he would finish in you the same grace also. Therefore, as ye abound everything in faith, in utterance, and knowledge, and in all diligence, and in, you, and in your love to us, that ye abound in grace also. Amen to lift them back up, to show them there was a purpose behind this. And again, he's using Titus as a messenger. Titus was apparently received well by the people. Paul tried to meet with him at Troas for a report. This was in 2 Corinthians 2, but he had to meet him at Macedonia instead. Again, Titus is a very busy guy. He may have perhaps been the one who delivered 2 Corinthians. It kind of sounds that way. 2 Timothy 4, which Paul writes shortly before his death, he sends a final message. Timothy mentions that Titus had gone to Dalmatia, the Roman province. Um, 2 Timothy 4, 4, 9, and 10. Do thy diligence and come shortly unto me, for Demoth has forsaken me, having loved the present world, and departed unto Thessalonica, Crescens to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. Again, we see Titus doesn't just stop. His time with Paul wasn't the end. That was just the beginning for him to move on and continue to serve, continue to spread the word. So what happens to him isn't fully known, although according to some sources, and strangely, the Catholic Encyclopedia, again, we'll take it with a grain of salt, but according to this, some, they founded a church in Dalmatia, the town of Salona, and died there in 65 A.D., Yes. Um, sources also show that they describe Salona as where some of the first martyrs were killed and that Dalmatia was the birthplace of Diocletian, who was a known emperor for persecuting Christians. So, again, assuming the information is correct, and how many Christians were martyred, and particularly in the region where Titus was known to be, it's possible he died a martyr. For his work. 
Now, three important lessons we get from Titus. Again, we've seen the bad. We're going to end with some good in a moment. (laughs) Stick with me on this one, and don't throw anything, but sometimes shock value is necessary. And I'm getting this from Paul. When describing heretics, he references a quote about Cretans being liars, crazy animals, lazy gluttons. Remember chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. Again, Paul says, one of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. He's getting their attention. He's speaking very bluntly here to show how foolish the heretics are. Sometimes you need to be a little more blunt and not dance around the facts. In essence, this is almost an ethnic joke where Paul's using a slightly off-color humor by referencing someone else. He does something similar in Galatians 5, and this one I looked up many, many commentaries. But he talks about the problems created by circumcisers. Galatians 5, 11 and 12 says, And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. I would they were even cut off which trouble you. And gentleman, Mr. Salter, who put this article together, says in plain speech what Paul is saying is, I wish these people who are bothering you would castrate themselves. Looking at through many commentaries, I would say 98% of the people agreed. That is what he is saying, that they would harm themselves because of what they're doing. And again, he's getting their attention. And we also know it's obviously wrong to speak in malicious ways or get involved in dirty jokes or ethnic jokes, things of that nature. Paul warns about it. But here he's making a point, getting their attention and using phrases that they would understand without crossing a line. Now, one interesting thing is, Steph has a book called Thou Spleeny Swag-Bellied Miscreant. The subtitle is, Create Your Own Shakespearean Insults. I believe you did. I didn't want to mention that. You go through this book, and in fact, I was looking at it tonight, and you flip these cards over, and it comes up with things, and I'm wondering if Shakespeare at some point read Paul because it's very similar. What he is doing here is using a language that, again, the people who need to know are going to know what he is saying. But he's doing it because he feels it's necessary to get their attention and to say, look, this is what's being said of you. And one of them says, they are always liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies. He's pointing it out to say, This is your reputation. This is who you are. Now, I'm not saying that this was Paul's opinion that he is quoting somebody to say, but again, it gets their attention to make them realize that you have a reputation out there. He makes it to get the point across. The other lessons we learn from Titus, family is as important as the ministry. Paul lists elders' qualifications. He highlights, you don't need to just be good with the content, not just be good with the public face, but also to be good husbands whose children have inherited the faith. Chapter one, verse six. He shows elders need to have sound character. They have to be leaders at home as well. Family is oftentimes the best indicator of how a person really behaves. We've seen that. Leaders may put on a good face at work, but behavior at home, how their children respond, speaks volumes. And we've even discussed that with potential candidates here. We also look at the family and see. And again, I know it's a source of contention, but this is God's word. This is his requirement. This is his instruction on what we need to look for in a leader and how the family is will speak volumes. 
elders must be people who don't just do good in public, but they also preach at home. Spouses, children, family, it's the first ministry. What are they doing there? You can't be a good Christian in public, but not at home. It will not make up for the neglect. A good leader is to have a solid home. And too common, we've seen this throughout the nation, the joke about pastor's kids, PKs, and how many of them fall away? How many of them, because the leadership isn't at home, it's only in the pulpit. And a good leader has to have control at home, has to have leadership at home. Parents who are emotionally absent are no good to a child. Sadly, I work with a gentleman who his son has been in and out of trouble with the law. He's now 35, and he still struggles, and the dad takes it very hard because he, he believes it's a reflection on him, but people will tell him, oh, no, no, he's his own man. He's a grown man. The reality is how much of it is a reflection of him. Think of a pastor. Their children at a young age are already unruly, disobedient, there's no control. There is no respect. And Titus is told it has to be at home as well as the office. The good thing, though, there is still room to turn around. Paul tells us repeatedly through the book, he spends a lot of time describing just how foolish heretics are, how foolish people can be. But he holds out hope. That's the hope we should have. He says, elders must show people who oppose sound teaching where they're wrong, to rebuke them. Again, we go back to Corinthians, and he showed where they were in error. But then he also praises them to say, you've done well. You've listened. You've changed. He describes the point of rebuking to make them strong in the faith. At the end, he wants them to come around. He doesn't just say, well, you're a lost cause. He reminds Timothy, or Titus, through the end of his book, saying, because of the love of God, because of the grace of God, and the freedom and glory in Christ in chapters 2 and 3, salvation appears to all men. There is hope. Nobody is beyond that. We need to recognize the damage and the danger that foolishness can cause, that heresy can cause, but we need to recognize it without writing off people as being unsalvageable. There is always hope in Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for the warnings that are in Titus, the warnings from Paul, what we need to be on guard for, what we need to look for, and how we need to act, how we need to behave at home and when we're in public. We know what we need to do. For those who we see still living or acting foolishly, there is hope. Nobody is unsalvageable through the hope, the love, and the blood of your Son. We thank you for that. In your Son, Jesus' name, amen.